And I do want to let you know that God loves you, that uh, he's interested in our growth, that we would continue to bear fruit, that as that song says, right, he deals perfectly with us in all of his ways, that he brings comfort to us when we're afflicted, uh, but he also challenges us to grow and bear more fruit when we're maybe too comfortable. And we're going to see uh, some moments like that today as we continue reading through the Gospel of Luke, uh, a series that we've been doing as a church. And uh, we're going to see the way that Jesus deals with some moments. Sometimes he is harsh, and other times he's incredibly compassionate. And it all depends on the attitude of the human heart that he's encountering. And being someone who is full of the Holy Spirit, he's operating in these gifts in which he knows the heart, he knows the thoughts and intents of the people that he's dealing with. And so he actually knows how to perfectly navigate these these situations. He knows how to walk through incredibly tense moments where you and I would be like getting really nervous and sometimes Jesus' disciples in those moments are getting really uncomfortable. But Jesus knows right? What is needed in each and every life, that he brings comfort and compassion, right? And mercy to those of us who need it, who are perhaps in a place feeling condemned, but he also would stir us up towards good works when we've fallen into complacency, which all of us can do. Uh, So we're picking this up in Luke chapter six, and uh, there's going to be a lot of concern that religious leaders that encounter Jesus have about the Sabbath day. And we've done some teaching on the Sabbath day before, back when we were reading through some of Exodus. And the Sabbath day was a day of rest that once a week on the seventh day, for the Jews that would have been Saturday, uh, they would cease from their normal work. They would set a day aside as holy unto God, where they would right no longer be focused about their own uh, business, doing their own things, but they would gather together, learn together, uh, that they would honor God in what they do. And, and in doing this, in keeping the Sabbath day, uh, it was modeled by, right, and even in the Ten Commandments it says this, that it was to remember the way that God had created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh, modeling this for us, that this is something that God did as a blessing for us, uh, but sadly, the way that it was implemented Uh, by the Pharisees, by the religious leaders, it ended up being a burdensome thing on the people. Uh, That throughout generations, uh, they would, uh, their own teachers of the law, their own rabbis would add traditions on top of what God's word had already told uh, them. And it made it, unfortunately, more burdensome. And what Jesus will see today, he'll kind of essentially say, you guys are missing the point. All right, and so let's dive into this. Uh, This is a narrative uh, in Luke chapter 6, verse 1. And as a result, it's it's not conveniently written to have just one, like, moral to the story, one little point that we walk away with. And so forgive me if I'm a little bit scatterbrained as I just kind of look at these different instances and moments and glimpses of these occurrences and then kind of examine what the scriptures would say uh, regarding those ideas. So it says this, on a Sabbath day, while he was going through the grain fields, Jesus' disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, right, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? They're saying this type of work isn't permissible on the Sabbath day. And Jesus answered them. Have you not read what David did, King David, right, Old Testament, David Goliath, dude, you might remember him. Uh, He says, have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence. So it was this bread that was in the house of God, in the synagogue or in the temple that was dedicated as unto the Lord, but was a portion set aside for the priests, okay? And he says that David and his men, who were not priests, went and ate this food when they were hungry. And he says, right, it was not lawful but for any but for the priests to eat. And he also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And so Jesus kind of answers their concern about his disciples eating food on the Sabbath day, but not just eating food, the fact that they were working by kind of processing this grain in their fingers. And, you know, they must have had some sort of regulation of like, nope, that's just over the line, that's not permissible on the Sabbath day, that counts as work, 
okay, uh, is what the Pharisees' argument was. But Jesus was saying, no, my disciples are not guilty of doing anything wrong in this moment, all right? And in fact, the one that they're traveling with is the Lord of the Sabbath. We'll hit more on that point in a little bit. But I think perhaps what's interesting, like the thing that no one is talking about, is that Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field and they're taking food that isn't theirs, Right? Like none of, the, none of Jesus nor his disciples or the Pharisees, these like very like law keeping sort of like detail oriented individuals, none of them are saying this is wrong because you're stealing. Because in that culture and in that nation, what they were doing was not considered stealing, even though it wasn't their field or their grain. Uh, and this, I, I think, all right, sorry, I'm getting all excited about like these Old Testament principles that God set up in the nation of Israel, I realize. Uh, but nonetheless, in Deuteronomy 23, verse 24, this is like this cool principle and culture that God had established for the nation of his people. He said this, if you go into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes as many as you wish. Like that's a really cool command of God, right? But he says, but you shall not put any in your bag. So it becomes stealing the minute you are putting it into a container ready to carry away for your lunch tomorrow, okay? But as long as you're like walking through their vineyard, you can just like pop grapes in your mouth and like it's perfectly fine in that culture, okay? That God set this up as a a system in place for the people of Israel. And then it continues. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Okay, so he once again sets up this boundary of what would be considered stealing your neighbor's stuff and what is just considered kind of like taking what's available for everybody if you're hungry. All right, and, and I think this is like a particularly interesting thing. Maybe, maybe you guys are like, what are, you, what are you talking about, Brian? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> but I think this is cool because in the nation that God had established, he set up this principle of kind of like welfare almost for the poor in which he would meet the needs. He would feed the hungry where any person could go into any field at any time and eat their fill. That food was available for you if you were poor. But at the same time, it was the system that had those who were doing this uh, participating in a portion of the work. That it wasn't just like that the food would be delivered to you, right? But it was like, no, you gotta get up and go and pick the food yourself. But it's available for you and it's not stealing. That God had established a culture of meeting needs and still encouraging work at the same time. So it's just kind of like this interesting little side note. I apologize for uh, the distraction. Uh, So Jesus' disciples were doing this sort of thing. It wasn't stealing, okay, in that culture. Now, don't try to apply that law here. It counts as stealing in our nation, okay? So, like, don't be like, hey, what's the big deal? I'm just taking your stuff. Uh, No, that doesn't doesn't work here. So it doesn't apply. Uh, But but one of the concerns is that they, they said this isn't lawful for you to do on the Sabbath day, okay? And so they were focused so much about these little details that were added by the rabbis over time, extensions of God's law, uh, that they're accusing Jesus and his disciples of of breaking that law, that they're working on the Sabbath. And this is something that Jesus is going to encounter throughout his earthly ministry, whereas he encounters these people that have been studying, yes, the Bible, right? The studying the Old Testament, that for generations they've been trying to apply it and honor God with their lives, but they've gotten somehow distracted and can't see the forest through the trees, all right? So so what they had practiced, uh, these traditions, uh, have eventually become kind of sacred to them when they weren't really sacred to God in the way that they were implementing them. Uh, In Mark chapter 7, Jesus dealing with like another type of tradition, this is what he says. He says in uh, verse 8, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. All right. And And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. All right. And so when Jesus encountered these moments where they had added to God's law and all of these details that were never a part of it, Right? He said, hey, listen, you've kind of replaced God's law with your own practice and pattern. And Jesus was one who was willing to offend them even though it was their cultural practice. Okay? Like he was willing to, to be a little bit offensive and abrasive in moments like that. Uh, in, in Matthew's account of this same story, Jesus uh, gives a little bit more detail. Matthew chapter 12. Okay? 
This is what he says in verse 5. Have you not read in the law, right, and this is kind of funny, Jesus talking to Bible scholars who, right, their dad and their granddad and their great-granddad, these were the priests, right, for generations studied the Bible, and what Jesus says to them is, have you read the Bible? Right? Like he's kind of like saying this, and it almost in my mind I think of it as a bit of a snarky way, but I, I'm sure Jesus wasn't snarky. But he says, have you not read in the law on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple, right, profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? He says that even according to your own tradition, right, the priests are working on the Sabbath day in order to offer these sacrifices, in order to teach to the people. And he says they're working on the Sabbath, right? So he's like, so clearly it doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. Uh, and he says this, verse 6, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And this is like incredibly like mind-bending sort of a, a concept, a claim that Jesus is making, uh, that the, the temple is this incredibly significant thing. Well, we'll get to that. Let me finish reading the story. Brian, I'm so excited. All right, here we go. All right. And if you had known what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. All right. So Jesus ends up making this claim that something uh, greater than the temple is here. Now, the temple in Israel represented God's presence, God's blessing, God's working through his chosen people, the nation of Israel. Right? Like it was this incredible symbol. Like it would be like the most sacred sort of thing you could imagine. Like imagine if we had like a really fancy, like holy feeling church building. Uh, but then also it's like some sort of like political symbol, almost like, you know, doing something destructive to the White House. It's like all of these things kind of combined. And Jesus is now making some claim that is culturally uh, abrasive to their most sacred building. All right? And the Bible does make a big deal about the temple, that like it was this sacred building in which God's presence would dwell, in which people would even turn towards in order to pray to God uh, from, that people would go and establish their relationship back to God when they've had sin in making a sacrifice, which thankfully we no longer have to do. All right? But Jesus is saying something greater than the temple is here, and he's referring to himself, which... If Jesus did not think he was God, all right, that would be a completely blasphemous claim. If Jesus was in fact not God, then Jesus was rightly crucified and put to death for his blasphemy. But the issue is that Jesus believed that he was in fact God in the flesh, God dwelling among us. That Jesus was a type and figure of the temple, right, of God's presence and God's kingdom being established on the earth. That Jesus was showing us what it was like for God to live in and among us. And that Jesus was greater than the temple. All right? Jesus was greater than the temple. In uh, this guy's commentary, Ellicott, I don't know if you guys are into Bible commentary, he said this. The body of the Son of Man was the truest, highest temple of God, and his disciples who ministered to him were entitled at least the same privilege as the priests in the temple at Jerusalem. So just as the priests were allowed to work on the Sabbath day in the temple, he's basically saying Jesus is the temple of God. His disciples who are serving him and expanding that kingdom, right, would be entitled some amount of the same privilege. And now Jesus makes this, uh, he quotes from this book of Hosea. Uh, he says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, or I desire compassion and not sacrifice. And this is actually the second time that Jesus is quoted and referenced this passage when dealing with religious leaders. He, he actually, in one instance, he says, right, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Or in this instance, in Matthew's account, he says, right, if you had known what this means, that I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you wouldn't have condemned the innocent. Okay, and so Jesus is quoting the Bible to these Bible scholars, and he's talking to them as if they're missing the big picture, as if they've completely ignored this concept in the Word of God, as they're so focused on all of these little details and ceremonial procession and making these sacrifices and offerings to God and keeping these rules in all these little uh, details and ways that they've missed the big idea that God is one who desires mercy. All right, that God is one who is about to go and do an incredible work of mercy. In, in fact, in Jesus' own life, 
He is the fulfillment of this exact concept because there's been tension, perhaps. If you read the Old Testament, it kind of ends with this tension of how is God going to forgive those who are guilty, right? How is God going to reconcile his need for justice while also loving his imperfect people, right? How are those two things going to be united? How is God going to solve that problem? And Jesus' life and ministry demonstrates how God does that, in which through Jesus' sacrifice, he will offer mercy to those who are guilty, right? Jesus is going to show God's grace and make opportunity, uh, forgiveness, that, that we could have peace with God, all right? And he does that by showing mercy. And so uh, this is like a really big deal, something that Jesus repeatedly is correcting the religious leaders on because they're so focused on keeping God's law, but they fail to love their neighbor effectively because of it. And Jesus actually says to them, right, you would not have condemned the innocent, referring to his disciples. And uh, just so you're aware, like if his disciples were doing something wrong, like Jesus would call them out for it. Uh, because we see that pattern throughout Jesus' life, that he's not afraid to correct wrong behavior. But he's actually telling the Pharisees, you've misjudged this moment. You've condemned those people who are actually innocent. Okay, that, that they, the disciples weren't doing anything wrong, but according to their own extension, their own traditions of God, right, that, that they've added to God's law, they're now condemning someone who is not guilty. All right, and so that's, that's an issue. And so what we see here is that Jesus refers to himself as someone who is greater than the temple, and he calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. So we've seen so far in the book of Luke Jesus has demonstrated authority over creation, where he's been able to heal the sick, right? Later on in his ministry, we'll see him calm storms and walk on water, that Jesus demonstrates authority over these things because he himself is creator. We've seen that Jesus has taught with authority, that when he teaches from the Bible, he doesn't teach as the scribes and Pharisees do, but he teaches as though the Bible is true, and he doesn't need to speculate about what God meant or what God intended by the law. And so even in a moment like this, he's able to bring correction and say, this is what the law actually meant in this moment. And so when Jesus says that he's Lord of the Sabbath, he's actually saying like, I exercise authority over the law because Jesus himself is God, the law giver. So he can let us know what the intent was, what the motive was behind laws like this. And so once again, in case like people ever tell you like, oh, Jesus didn't claim to be God, uh, he did, right? Multiple times, all the time in his earthly ministry, was he, making, he was making claims like this. He was saying that he was able to determine whether, whether or not the law meant a particular thing, right? Which is a really big deal because we, right, don't have authority over God's word. Like, we don't, we don't get to do that. If, if you ever are worried about me doing that sort of thing, then that would mean I'm, like, practicing things like a cult leader. And we don't get to do that, right? I am in submission to the same word of God as all of us, all right? So we don't get to do that. But Jesus is one who can. And in fact, uh, when dealing with the Sabbath, he corrects and clarifies. But also in, in Matthew 19, uh, I don't know if I have this verse on the screen, but he said to them, talking about, like, this idea of divorce, he gave clarity about Divorce. He says, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And so Jesus regularly clarifies what the law was about. All right? And here we see that he makes the significant point about mercy being the focus and emphasis over sacrifice. And so now we've got to be a little bit careful here. All right, because the tendency might be like, see, oh, look, looks like Jesus kind of overrode their traditions. And therefore, that must mean like we just get to like do whatever we want with the traditions of men or the law of God that's been handed down to us. And that, that's not the case, like because you and I, we are not Lord over the Sabbath. Right. We're not Lord over these things. And the early church did have to resolve that of like, OK, so what amount of this old covenant law are we required to fulfill or keep, right? Uh, and, right, they've sorted those things out. Many of these ceremonial things we no longer practice because they were completed in Jesus. 
Okay? Even in the case of the Ten Commandments, nine out of the Ten Commandments are given as commands again in the New Testament. Okay? Uh, the Sabbath day is actually not one that Christians are required to keep in that regard. Okay? Uh, but we do see that this is the case. And so we, we do need to be cautious. Like, this doesn't necessarily mean it's a free for all, that we just get to do whatever we would desire to do and just be like, hey, Lord of the Sabbath, like, I can do, I can break whatever law. I want. That's not what Jesus would call us to do. Jesus calls us to, right, obey him and not just like one time when we turn to him to repent and trust in him, but we are to follow him as if he might have instruction for our entire lives on this earth, all right, that we're meant to continue to obey him. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus gives, uh, or Mark writes down further clarity that Jesus gives about the Sabbath. Uh, in 227, he says, uh, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees were implementing the Sabbath day in a way that was harmful to people. They were adding burdens onto people that were not setting them free in the way that God desired. But Jesus lets us in on this little secret about God's laws, that all of God's laws were actually written for our benefit, for our good for our blessing that things like the sabbath day were meant to be a good thing for us uh, that he didn't that god didn't uh, make us to be sabbath keepers okay it, it's not like god was you know sitting in eternity past and he's like man i've got all these awesome rules i should make some people that will keep my awesome rules like that's not the order of events uh, he in fact made us right he made us and then he made these laws, because he loves us, because he wants to protect us from deceit, right, destructive things like sin, like when he would approach Cain and say that sin is crouching at your door ready to devour you, right, he sets a boundary because he loves us. And so even something like the Sabbath day is intended to be a blessing to you and I. And so all of law, God's laws are written for our good. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that our perception of what would be good for us is now suddenly God's law, okay? Because God will still give commands in the New Testament that are regularly in contradiction and at odds with our own flesh desires, okay? The Bible talks about that our bodies are at war with our spirits. And so it doesn't mean that like you and I can just be like, well, like God's laws are for our good, so whatever I think is good for me must therefore be God's law. That is not how it works, okay? Because God gives commands that would call us to do things that are perhaps difficult or challenging or even sacrificial, like self-sacrificing love for other people, right? We're called in the Bible to crucify our flesh, right? To put to death the deeds of the body, right? That those don't sound like things that my body would consider good for me, but in fact, they are. They produce freedom from slavery to sin. And God, because he loves us, does, in fact, invite us into that sort of freedom. Right? And so God's laws uh, that we do have as commands, when we keep them, it gives us confidence. Right? It gives us peace with God that we don't need to walk in condemnation, that we can live in freedom from sin, that we can avoid unnecessary suffering that are right, foolish choices would bring on us, right, that God's like, hey, listen, if you just stay within the guardrails, you don't crash into the ditch, right, God's inviting us into something that is going to produce abundance in our lives, so, so that's Jesus's kind of first encounter with the Sabbath day thing, I'm going to see how far I can get with some of these other stories, but uh, it's the same sort of theme, and Luke writes both of these passages together, one, because yes, he's trying to write a chronological order of the events of Jesus's life, but also notice thematically of what the Holy Spirit's kind of pointing out in these moments. Okay, so uh, verse 6, back in Luke chapter 6. On another Sabbath day, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched Jesus, watched him, to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath day so that they might find a reason to accuse him. All right, and so like, think about how crazy of a mindset that is. That like, you're there on the Sabbath day, a dude has a withered hand, Jesus is teaching, 
and you're not thinking about like, oh, I wonder if Jesus is going to heal this guy. What if God is working mightily in our midst in this incredible way? Like, no, no, no. You're whole, the whole time being like, if Jesus heals that guy, we've got him. Like, we've got him so good because then Jesus would have healed on the Sabbath and he broke the Sabbath, right? Like, and that's like their whole focus, right? Like, this is incredible, like that that would be their mindset, trying to figure out, like, instead of is God going to show compassion and grace and mercy healing this person that's got a withered hand, right? Or, right, like, are they going to just find a way to accuse Jesus? And this is regularly the issue that's going on in their hearts. The Bible gives us clarity on those facts, that, that not all asking is seeking a genuine answer, that sometimes the scribes or Pharisees or these lawyers uh, of the law would be trying to ask a question in order to trap Jesus. Or they're trying to like stage this moment uh, in order to accuse Jesus of doing something wrong. Whether it's a healing someone on the Sabbath day or like whenever they bring like, you know, when they bring the adulterous woman in front of Jesus in the midst of a crowd and they're like, what are you going to do, Jesus? The law says this, right? And they're like, they're trying to trap Jesus. They're not authentically seeking God, all right? But this is what uh, Jesus does. Verse 8, but he knew their thoughts, okay? And I don't think that's just because Jesus was incredibly perceptive, but I do genuinely believe that Jesus operating in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit being poured out in his life without measure, the Bible says, he was probably operating in like a gift of knowledge where the Holy Spirit's being like, all right, Jesus, you're about to heal this dude, but these guys are all thinking this right now. It needs to be addressed, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so it's kind of cool that the Holy Spirit's just telling Jesus what these people are thinking in this moment. And you and I should expect the Holy Spirit to be at work in our lives because he gives gifts as he wills to operate in that we would be able to minister to people and be a light to this world, that we would be equipped for the mission that God has called us on. And so Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And so Jesus asks this question. Now, I don't think Jesus was planning on harming this guy. And he's like, am I free to harm this dude on the Sabbath day? I think what he was kind of implying was that to uh, choose to not do good, to, uh, to choose to omit doing the good thing would be to bring harm on this individual. Uh, there's, a, there's a proverb that says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in, the in your power, the power of your hand, to do it. Okay, and so Jesus is saying, like, I can't ignore, right, doing this good thing for this person. All right, that the right thing to do would, do, uh, would be to heal this man who Jesus was empowered by the Spirit to do. And notice, Jesus wasn't afraid of offending the Pharisees. He didn't just turn to this guy and be like, hey, uh, could you come back tomorrow? Like, I'll be around tomorrow and I could heal you, right? He didn't try to avoid this controversial issue, right? He didn't tiptoe around something difficult in order to avoid offending them. When it came to loving God and loving others, Jesus was willing to offend, okay? Other times, Jesus is like, hey, like the temple tax, who cares? We don't need to do that, but sure, we'll pay the temple tax so we don't offend these people. All right, but then in other instances, Jesus is like flat out speaking parables against people as they're in a crowd of others. And Jesus' disciples are like, oh my gosh, does he, just, does he realize what he just said? Like, Jesus, do you realize you've offended them by saying that parable? And Jesus is like, just almost doesn't care because he's more interested in loving people and inviting them into truth than coddling them in some deceptive, uh, deceptive lie. Right? And so this is what Jesus does here. Right? He, he says, listen, what do you want me to do? Is it lawful to heal someone on the Sabbath? Are you allowed to do good things on the Sabbath day? All right? Or in uh, Mark's account of this same event, he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. All right? So Jesus knew the thoughts and intents of their hearts. And Jesus was angry. Right? Jesus was angry that these little detail sort of things, their own traditions and practices, their own culture that had been stacked on top of God's law would interfere with their loving their neighbor. Right? That it would interfere with their showing compassion on this man. And Jesus was angry about that. 
right? Like, and that's something that perhaps might take us a little bit of time. This is a, a benefit of reading through a gospel is like we sometimes have these convenient pictures of Jesus that are like a half version of Jesus. And you and I all have our own favorite version of Jesus where we only like certain aspects of him. But then it's like, man, Jesus was like angry at these dudes because of their attitude. Right? And not only was he angry, but he was grieved. He was heartbroken because he saw that their hearts were hard. All right? And so Jesus calls us to love our neighbors. Right? That's something that Jesus invites us to do, that we should do. And he's kind of caught up on the fact that these guys are like so focused on these little rules. So verse 10, it says, After looking around at them, uh, he said to them, Stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored. But they, the Pharisees, were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. All right? And so they didn't have the capacity to appreciate that God did a miracle in their midst, that God had healed this person that had this infirmity, right? They didn't have the capacity to glorify God over this miracle that had taken place. And instead, they're angry that Jesus healed on the Sabbath day, right? So this is this incredible sort of thing. And we see these same sorts of trends follow through the rest of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Luke. I was going to skip and read those, but but we won't. But Jesus still makes these sorts of points. Actually, let's, let's, uh, all right. I'll I'll do a (laughs) shortcut version, tell you what. On the fly. Gentlemen in the back, could you jump to Luke 13, maybe, uh, Verse 15? Yeah. Luke 13, 15. Sorry, guys. Thanks for helping me out. All right. So another instance, Jesus is going to heal someone on the Sabbath day, and the religious leaders are like, you can't heal on the Sabbath day. Right? Like SpongeBob meme. You know, meme, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and you're like, that's not allowed, Jesus. And, and Jesus is going to heal on the Sabbath day. And they're like, no, six days you can work. The seventh day, no, don't get healed on the seventh day. And this is what Jesus says uh, in not the most polite way, right? So once again, let's, let's kind of let Jesus break the box of what we think Jesus is like. And notice that he was willing to say kind of rude things sometimes when it was appropriate. Uh, so the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his dox, ox or his dox, whatever, ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water? And ought not this woman... A daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and the people rejoiced at the glorious things done by him. And so Jesus is saying, like, you guys care for your own animals more than you do this person who's been bound for 18 years, right? And you're so caught up on this, but like... On the Sabbath day, you give water to your animals and you're not going to loose this woman? You're not going to allow me to heal this person? A daughter of Abraham, right? One of your own kinsmen, right? This is incredible. So Jesus is just baffled, right, at their attitude, right? He's so just like set back and he calls them hypocrites, right? Because they're saying, you already do work. You did work this morning when you watered your ox, right? And you won't let me set this woman free. So, one of the things that Jesus uh, deals with, with this heart attitude of the Pharisees, and I know it's probably easy for us to sit in judgment of them, and at least we wouldn't be judging uh, or condemning the innocent, as Jesus said they did, because we know what Jesus said about them. So it's like, if we're in the agree with Jesus camp, it's right judgment, okay? But nonetheless, like, we've got to be cautious of our own hearts, because we might fall into those same sort of tendencies, Okay, Uh, so so notice this. This is one of the ways that Jesus dealt with the Pharisees, right? They were so focused in honoring God in very particular and ceremonial ways. They were genuinely trying to please God, I think. Or, as Jesus pointed out, sometimes they were just more caught up in, like, their appearance and looking holy before other people. But in in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus actually, uh, the whole chapter almost, is just like this sick burn that Jesus does against the Pharisees. And and check out this, Matthew 23, 23. He says this to them, Woe to you, right? How unfortunate for you, sort of thing. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice and... 
and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Okay? And so, so the example he's giving is the fact that they are so particular in keeping their rules that they're like, okay, I've got my little herb garden and 10% of all of my herbs, right, one out of 10 are going to go to the temple. And so they're so careful about doing all of these particular little details, but he says, like, you've missed the big picture, right, what he calls the weightier matters of the law, right, that we are attentive to justice and mercy and faithfulness. Now, notice what he says, though. He says, these you ought to have done, right? You still should do the right thing. You still should, when appropriate, when the law applies to you, keep the law. But don't do it ignoring or neglecting these weightier matters, okay? In uh, Luke's account of the same passage, Luke eleven forty two, 42, it says, For you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So what Jesus is interested in is that on the Sabbath day, that the hungry are still fed, all right? That those who are sick are still healed, that God's mercy is shown on those days. And he would consider these things to be weightier matters, as in these are more important, okay? And, and uh, I know like that sometimes is like weird for us to adjust to because, you know, usually in a somewhat opposite example, uh, people will say like, well, all, all sin is the same. And in some regards it is, right? All sin separates us from God, whether it's, uh, right, lust in my heart or adultery that's being acted on, okay? Uh, all sin separates us from God, but not all sin is the same in consequence on the earth, right? Like, if you're angry with your brother without cause, Jesus says, that's wrong, all right? But if you murder your brother, it's also wrong. Both of those things will separate you from God, and you need to be forgiven of that. But one of those things definitely has an earthly consequence that is different than the other, Right? Like spitting in your brother's face doesn't get you the death penalty. Murdering your brother might. Okay? So there's weightier things that God cares about. Now, he doesn't always give us a list of what those things are, but it's worth being aware of that there are things that are dearer to the heart of God than other things. And in this instance, he says, yeah, this issue of keeping these uh, little laws is important. But at the same time, don't overlook, don't neglect these weightier matters of justice and mercy, okay? That loving God is more important. And so Jesus says, do both. Do both, right? Like the convenient thing for us is that either Jesus would tell us if we're like good doobie law keeper box checkers, that like he just says, keep checking your boxes, you can ignore those other things. And we'd be like, yeah, I'm good. Right? Or if we're people who are not interested in any of right, keeping God's moral laws, but we're like, no, I'm just going to show God's love to everybody. Right? We'd want Jesus to say, yeah, show God's love to everybody, and then like, we'd want to be able to ignore those other issues. But that's not what Jesus says. He actually says, do both, which I realize is actually inconvenient and hard for all of us. Right? <laughs> like, but when led by the Spirit, we're empowered to do exactly what he invites us to do. And he's led a life that we can see as an example as to how we ought to live navigating situations like this, right? We're, we're not going to encounter, right, difficult situations about the Sabbath day where we live right now, right? But we're going to encounter other things that we're, we're going to have to figure out. And the way Jesus walked through those things is like this. It says this in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Right? God himself became a human being and lived among us. Just like we said earlier, Jesus is greater than the temple. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That Jesus lived a life with both of those things to full capacity. Right? He didn't compromise one in order to obtain the other. Okay, that, that Jesus lived a life that was full of grace, showing mercy on sinners like you and I, right? Well, at the same time, inviting us to freedom and sanctification that we would no longer be slaves to sin, right? He would teach the truth, okay? And he invites us to do that same <coughs> sort of thing, do both, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do both. All right, do both of those things. 
Uh, or in the book of James, Jesus' brother. James chapter 1, check this out. <coughs> Man, sometimes James writes almost, almost harder than Jesus. This is, this is tricky. Whew, all right. I don't... If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. All right, Th thanks, James. Uh, ouch, right? Like, so James is saying like, that there are people who act religious but are missing out on something bigger that God's called them to do. And in fact, all of their little religious activities aren't really accounting to much if they're not applying it to their lives. And then he keeps going. Th thankfully, he gives us some more clarity. Verse 27. He tells us what pure religion is, religion that wouldn't be worthless. Okay? He says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, right? in their time of need, that you're visiting and showing compassion on the people that God loves so much. Right? That we're caring for people. That we're not just like living our own little lives according to like Ten Commandments or whatever. And ignoring the need of the world around us. Right? That Jesus is calling us and inviting us to do something that right, we care and love other people. That we love our neighbors. That our religion wouldn't be worthless. Right? That we wouldn't deceive our own hearts by doing only half of what God invites us into. But then the next part, it says this. And to keep oneself unstained from the world. All right, that you and I, we live in this world, but we're not to be of this world. We're not supposed to act like this world. There's supposed to be something distinct and different about the lives of followers of Jesus. That you and I would be a light to this world. That there's something that is going to stand in contrast to the rest of society around us. All right, that we will care for those in need, but at the same time, we will live lives that are unstained by the world. All right, so just because we might, you know, try to walk in love towards our neighbor doesn't mean we get to ignore the sin in our own lives, right? We can't get to just like kind of pretend like it's not a big deal, right? We actually have to live a life being willing to, to offer those things up to God, recognizing their need for forgiveness. Right? Recognizing that God is trying to produce in us a character that is like his. That loves others, but also that loves right, and does the things that are godly. Okay? And so we've got to be careful that we don't, as the book of Hebrews says, trample on God's mercy. Right? It's like this heavy idea. That we don't just like assume forgiveness for everything. That we no longer deal with our own sin as something that's significant or harmful. To us or others, right? And so Jesus, right, he was frustrated with the hearts of the Pharisees. He was angry, the Bible says, grieved because of the hardness of their hearts, right? Because they had hard hearts towards their neighbors. And like, I think we get that, right? Some of us might have a tendency to more easily kind of walk and love God and, and try to do this Pharisee type thing in order to please him, but maybe struggle in loving our neighbors, or maybe some of us are better at loving our neighbors or come to that tendency a little bit easier, but want to ignore all of these things that God wants to clean up in our own lives, right? Uh, but it's actually possible to have a hard heart in both of those areas, all right? In both of those areas. It's possible to have a hard heart towards our neighbor. And that's something that God would be grieved about, that he would invite us to step out of our comfort zone. Right? To go beyond maybe our, our practices and traditions while still honoring God and being unstained from the world in order to show them his love. Right? But check this out. Ephesians chapter 4. So not only can our hearts be hard towards others, uh, declining to show mercy, but we can also have a hard heart towards God. It says this, uh, Ephesians 4, 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. That the life, right, of a follower of Jesus is not to act like the world. He says that they live their lives in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. 
So what, what the Bible's saying here is that you and I have the tendency that our hearts can become hard towards God. That we can distance ourselves from the life that God would invite us into. That not only can our hearts be hard towards other people, right, but we could choose to live a life driven by our own desires, right, deceived by our own flesh, right, living a life based on our feelings and our senses, right, that we'd be greedy to just do everything that is impure. And so we've got to recognize, like, we need to live in a way, right, that is going to honor God while still show his love and compassion towards others. Right? Like this, this is uncomfortable stuff, right? Because it's not like any of us can just sit here and be like, oh, I've got both of those things so solved, right? Like not at all. And so God's word fortunately brings about fruit in our lives in a way that gives glory to him, right? That allows us to walk in further freedom. So the Pharisees, one of the dangers is, I'm going to end with these thoughts, I think. I'm going to try. The Pharisees, one of the dangers is to, to consider is that they spent generations studying the Bible and missed the big picture. And what Jesus said was that they neglected the weightier matters of the law. All right? And, and you and I, we need to be cautious that we could fall into the same type of neglect. Right? We can't just look back at them and be like, those guys were crazy. They completely missed the whole Jesus thing. It was right in front of them. Right? No, like we need to be aware that we can read scripture in the same way with blinders on of, of reading only passages or interpreting things that are only convenient to us, right? That we could miss really large portions of God's heart for humanity, right? For us and for others. So we've got to be careful, right? So in the case of the Pharisees in Matthew 23, right? He said that they neglected justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Or in Luke's account, right? That they neglected justice and the love of God. But what about us? Does the Bible ever like address Christians who are aware of what God has done for us? Who are aware of the salvation that he has given us? Right? Like does the Bible ever warn us of things that we have the capacity to neglect? And, and the Bible does. All right. So let's take a quick look at these sorts of things that you and I are susceptible to. Okay. Uh, it says this in, in Hebrews. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. All right? Just like the Pharisees, our hearts can drift from the thing that God would invite us to. And so here's, here's some things that the New Testament, right? Just choose, choose the one that each of us need to work on. Uh, in 1 Timothy 4.14, 4, yeah, you guys can just put that up on the screen. The Bible says, right, do not neglect the gift that you have which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. That some of us can fall into neglect when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit that he wants to be stirred up in us. It's something that you and I have the tendency to do, to forget that sort of thing which God would consider important. Or Hebrews 2, it says that uh, we can, it's possible to neglect this incredible gift, this great salvation that we've been offered that we need to remind ourselves of God's incredible mercy and what he's done for us. Or in Hebrews 10, it's possible to fall into the neglect of meeting together. But as the time draws near, that we should right, encourage one another in this way. That it's possible that as believers, knowing Jesus and his love for us, that we could fall into that habit. Or in Hebrews 13, it says, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Right, That you and I, sometimes we could be so caught up on, on all of these other God issues that we ignore the world around us. And it's possible for Christians, followers of Jesus, to neglect that very important thing. And then Hebrews 13, 16, it says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And so the fact that God tells us and warns us not to neglect these things would suggest that you and I, in our own accounting of these issues, might undervalue them, right? That you and I might fall into the pattern or routine of not thinking that these are that big of a deal, right? But God is reminding us because he cares for us and wants to do these weighty, important things. So let's, let's pray before we go back into worship. Heavenly Father, None of our hearts are untouched by your word this morning. 
I thank you, Lord, that you invite us to to bear fruit, uh, that you invite us to stir up gifts in us, to be a part of the body of believers, to grow together, to be a light to this world. I pray, Lord, that where each of us have have grown complacent, that you would call us to to freedom, uh, that you would offer us forgiveness as you do, that we would be able to walk without condemnation. That, Lord, we wouldn't look at some list of things that we have the potential to neglect and then just feel condemned, but we would obtain the mercy that you offer us, that we would enjoy the fact that you are our dad, that we can go to you and have a relationship with you, and that, Lord, you invite us to do, at times, difficult things. I pray, God, that you would stir up in our hearts that we would be mindful of the things that you are compassionate about, that we would not ignore these weighty issues, that, Lord, we wouldn't fall into tendencies of, of only somehow loving you and ignoring the people around us, or that we wouldn't fall into the trap of attempting to love others as they would define as love and ignoring the freedom that you would have us call them to. So, Lord, I ask that this day you would do a mighty work in us. Wake us up to what you've called us to do. Operate in your gifts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.